Okay, I think we'll get going. So it's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Eng. Uh, comes with it, he's just finishing up a PhD at the University of Cambridge, uh, the Engineering Design Research Center. Uh, and he's gonna to talk to us about diagrammatic representations. And, and I think try to convince us that these are useful for not only design and our thinking about design, but collaboration and other things. And, and uh, I'm very impressed by some of his, uh, his work. Uh, and I was reminded many years ago at the beginning at Xerox Park, uh, they built a system called note cards uh, that Frank Halaz and Tom Moran and folks were involved in. And I remember John Seeley Brown trying to convince me that these kind of note cards were going to revolutionize what was going on because, for example, uh, lower level people in organizations could pass forward all of the ideas behind their decisions. So you could view them both at the high level of what their decision is, but really look down and judge them of what alternatives and stuff. And I think these kind of diagrammatic representations are particularly amenable to that kind of thing. So. Right, here we go. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, as mentioned before, my name is Nathan Eng, uh, and I'm here to present to you some ideas and concepts uh, behind these uh, diagramming and visualization tools, which I term hypermedia diagrams, uh, how they help us think about thinking, metacognition, and how this might contribute to the evolution or, or change of how design is done. Just a, a quick uh, get to know the audience. Uh, by show of hands, here, just get a sense of how many people are uh, visiting from outside? Okay. Uh, how many are from here uh, in, distributed, in the distributed cognition or HCI group? How many people from business? Uh, arts, uh, design, other, and, <laughs> and, and people who really feel like that those sorts of categories aren't great ways of describing what they do. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, cool. So, underlying question uh, kind of driving this presentation is how do we think about our thinking and design, and why would we want to do that? Well. Uh, in terms of advancing design as a discipline, there's potentially some value in seeing how experts go about solving problems and getting a better understanding of what makes an expert designer. Uh, in terms of uh, multidisciplinary co collaboration, thinking about the kinds of thinking that different disciplines bring to a design and how those kinds of thinking can fit together and complement each other in a productive way. Uh, and also just generally thinking about the relationship between rational and creative thinking and what are good ways of making sure that those complement each other in uh, final design. To think about uh, modern products like computers or whatnot where you have lots of different, um, a lot of the value that uh, they have in terms of saleability and whatnot maybe comes from creative design, but they are also technical artifacts that have lots of very intense systems engineering uh, and requirements that need to be meshed together in a very coherent fashion. So, uh, without talking too much about it, um, one of the themes here is to learn by doing. So let's try out an example of the kind of diagramming that I'm talking about. What I'm gonna do is exit the presentation and do uh, a kind of exercise uh, which is referred to as dialogue mapping. And in dialogue mapping, what you have is a diagram based on a kind of notation, which I'll introduce, uh, used as a live meeting minute ticking device to help untangle the narrative. So when people are having a discussion in a meeting, all of their different statements and ideas are coming out in sequence because we don't want to have everything talking at the same time. It would be difficult to understand. However, because of that sequence of uh, things coming out ser uh, in serial positions, uh, you can get lost in terms of how the different ideas relate to each other and, and maybe even whether or not the different ideas relate to each other. So we've all had the experience of being in different kinds of meetings where you just kind of lose the plot and you aren't sure what you're talking about, or new items come up that aren't related to the core meeting and discussion topic, but are really important work that need to be discussed. And how do you manage all of those different parallel threads? So for this scenario, I'm going to say, uh, let's pretend we're in a uh, management meeting of some kind where the core topic of discussion is how can we possibly make more money? Uh, this makes for an interesting exercise because people come up with all kinds of very creative uh, ideas on this. So just uh, calling out, or uh, maybe we'll do 
raising hands so I can have time to write things down, but anyone have ideas on how one could make more money? Okay. So here, you note the, um, the diagram is separated into kind of three types of, types of elements. So we have issues or questions, which are kind of the focal point. We have different potential answers. So made stand can be a, an option. Uh, and then you have arguments which argue for or against those answers. So what are, what's the reason that a lemonade stand is a good idea? Okay, what's an argument maybe against a lemonade stand? Okay, uh, now that's a good point. So this is a problem with lemonade, but what about? Arnold Palmer's. Yeah. So this is an argument against, a counter argument. So in, in a sense, it's a bit of a double negative, but it, if when we go back at the end of the meeting and reevaluate the system, you start at the bottom and say, well, does the fact that spike, spiked lemonade might be better in terms of commodity items defeat the argument of the fact that lemonade is a commodity item? I would suspect that it doesn't because alcoholic drinks, while they might have a different market, are not necessarily a whole lot better. It doesn't change the fundamental fact that it's a commodity I have item. A question. Do you want questions that might divert you, which is part of the argument, or do you want to give the whole talk and then have questions? Uh, let's have discussion throughout, I think. I have about... Why uh, is spiked lemonade a negative on the commodity item as opposed to a new topic? The lemonade stand is one thing, uh, alcoholic lemonade is a separate idea. How do you distinguish between those two? Uh, bottom line, it depends on the authoring style of the person writing it down. And one of the points of having this as a shared display is people can bring up objections like that and say, well, actually, no, this is what I meant. Or I thought this is what I meant, but actually I meant two different things. And that's where the diagramming comes in useful for splitting things up. So we'll take that objection and actually just make a different idea. So can't spell lemonade today. Yeah, well, here's where it being a freeform diagram, this is where this scheme is slightly different than a lot of other argumentation visualization tools, is because it's freeform, you can do things like cross branching. So the fact that it's a commodity item actually applies to those two different options. Um, and I'm going to change this to uh, a pro and attach it to the appropriate part. So we sort of refactored the thinking. I apologize a little bit. I'm slow this morning on this because the screen's at a weird angle. But, yeah. So um, related to, to this, like one of the things you know that you have is kind of these like mutually exclusive categories. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering about things like you know like right, like all of these things are kind of interactive, like production mm -hmm. effects making no sense. So like you know, is there a way to say so? Really, it's not that it's lemonade stand and spiked lemonade is mutually exclusive thing, but it's saying lemonade stand and then there's you know, adding the alcohol is maybe, you know, going to fundamentally change the direction of this idea, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble with like the mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. the idea that all these ideas could be. Well, it depends how you refactor the map ultimately. So we could have, so we could decide that that lemonade stand and spike lemonade and different kinds of beverages are actually a subcategory of um, solution. So in that case, what I would do is I would add um, an answer up here, which is actually just some sort of fast-moving consumer good commodity, which uh, brings them under the umbrella of one category. Uh, one of the other things you can do in this kind of tool is I can um, move one item into another. So there are different ways of representing that categorical, depend categorical dependency and also categorical overlap. Uh, so I've got an example here of this con argument belongs to two different things. Right. So it all depends on uh, what the particular right. items. But maybe it affects those two different things differently. True. So is there a way to represent that like a different kind of arrow? Uh, in principle, yes. Um, there are different arrow styles and line styles available. Uh, and what it boils down to is 
for any particular set of ideas, they're going to be related in, in different and interesting ways. And the point of the tool is to have those different ways available and represent the relationships between the ideas in a, in a way which is as high, as high fidelity to the structure of the ideas as possible. So you're not constrained to just doing a tree or a branched tree or a set of categories or outlines. You could also turn around and go, um, you could have a, a, a set of items which are maybe one set of categories and another set of categories and maybe some overlap in between. So you have partial belonging and full belonging for different items. So it's all, all in how you visualize it and some of that's to do with the convention that you are using at, at, among the group, what people will understand. Sorry? So I'll, I'll make a dramatized version of an argument that I only half believe, but the dramatic version makes for better discussion. Okay. Is uh, structured diagrams empirically always lose, especially for informal discussion. Mm -hmm. So if you look back in the HCI literature, whether it's the, you know, uh, people have published lots of strategies for making structured diagrams. None of them have gained traction, especially for informal stuff. And um, one example I think that's useful about this is UML. That I tried for a decade to use UML. Mm -hmm. I could never quite do it. And I realized that the demands of the, the insight that you should draw a diagram about software is hugely powerful. You know, software discussions benefit tremendously from having a written representation. Demanding that the representation fit a structure just gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you see our whiteboards, you know, we share your, your belief that writing things down is super, super helpful because it achieves the common ground in meetings. But what are we losing by having the unstructured format Um, the short answer is one of the things that I include in the definition of these hyper, diagram, hyper media diagramming tools is that fundamentally they're ways of laying things out in space. And so you can use this language to help structure an area during a meeting or something like that because that's, that's kind of the added value you need. There are certain kinds of transformations with this like questioning the question or adding arguments or looking at the relationship between categories which this particular set of symbols affords. If that set of symbols is not helping you, then you just use generic nodes, or you use images, or you use sketches, or you use sections of spreadsheets. I'll show examples, I have a few examples embedded later on, of bringing together different kinds of, uh, of thing, and um, how uh, different designers ha have made use of that. There's actually an interesting example from fashion, which speaks to that, I'll, I'll get to. Yeah, maybe just follow quickly on Scott's thing. I mean, Tom Moran, who was involved in this early new cards thing, I subsequently did a system at IBM, I forget the name of it, but it started more with sketching. Uh, and then he allowed you to operate on those sketches, like to put a region over this and tell it it's a list. Mm -hmm. So all kinds of things could happen as a result of that. This is the activity project. Right. Yeah. Activities yeah. in the name yeah. somewhere. And, and I think you know that, that tension between the naturalness and ease of sketching and the richness of the vocabulary you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, with the advantages of it being computational and, you know, being able to be laid out other ways and do other things to it, I think the, the tension between those two is a really interesting mm -hmm. research aspect. Yeah, I've, I've got a diagram I need to show you later, which is, is kind of a scheme of looking at that. So the, the I really like that you brought up sketching because I think if I had to encapsulate the idea behind this sort of diagramming work, and there are other languages, it's not all questions and answers and whatnot, is that um, they fit a lot of the roles that sketching does on pen and paper in the computer. And what I mean by that is it's not uh, one of the things in HCI is um, how difficult, one of the results from HCI is how difficult it is to make a sketching application on a computer based tool because there are different affordances in the different media which allow for different kinds of interaction and different kinds of, inter of shareability and interaction. What this does is it allows you to do the kinds of things in sketching uh, that are valuable, like putting ideas down quickly and making decisions later and doing stuff like that, with some of the affordances of a computer-based medium where you can include linking, where the representation is much more malleable and you can do things like um, one of the uh, key ideas is, this, is that when you're building a set of ideas and building coherence, 
doing things in a diagram like this allows you to build that coherence incrementally. So it's about doing the work incrementally, moving back and forward on that spectrum between a messy pile of ideas and something more formal, while still having places where you can live in between. And in terms of a cognitive value, um, being able to move back and forth on that spectrum means you're only doing as much work or as many transformations on any given element as you can handle or as you find useful at a time. One of the problems with a lot of, if you talk about the formalization in a diagram or something like UML, that far end of the spectrum from engineering uh, are things like requirements management systems or these database systems. I've got um, interviews from engineers and aerospace companies turning around saying, I absolutely hate using this database system because I have to do absolutely everything at once. All I want to do is come up with some sort of placeholder for this requirement or this need and put it down and move on to the next one. I don't want to put a tracking number down and decide who's responsible for it and all that sort of stuff. And that detracts so much from the workflow of trying to figure out what the problem is, which is what requirements is. It's trying to find a good way of describing the problem. Sorry, you had a question? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I, I don't want to like take over and go off of this question. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, another point to be made about this loose structure is uh, it kind of prompts you as to what might be needed. So say we filled out this structure and decided we still didn't feel like we had the problem. We can go up to the top of the structure and go, well, actually, is that the right question? Right? What would be an alternative question to how can we make more money that still solves similar issues or addresses similar parts of the problem? Spend less money. Or, or, or the, the sort of macro problem of how do we balance right so actually I'm going to make that oh right <laughs> how do you maximize the income expense ratio yeah all right actually that's 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 we probably the best phrase, but yeah. <laughs> and that, of course, we talk about design thinking and the importance of solving the right problem. That expands our thinking in terms of creative options into thinking about, well, how can we reduce our expenses? But also preserves the work that we've done to this point in terms of discussing the original question. And that's part of the power of this moving incrementally from this disordered, chaotic, a fuzzy set of ideas to something more coherent. We've preserved the ideas or the work that we've done so far, as well as opening up the space. One more thing I want to show quickly uh, is once we've gone through the space, one of the things we do is we go and evaluate, you know, is this an important con or is it something that isn't really relevant? So I'm going to put this as a dom dominant argument. Commodity items just aren't great ways to make money. Someone will undercut you. Someone will manufacture something for less. Because that is dominant over these two, we go up and propagate that transformation. Actually, that particular item is either unlikely or outright rejected. And right, we'll say maybe spike lemonade is slightly better. So we'll just unlikely. Uh, and then we can move through and say eventually we decide this isn't, uh, this is the best way to solve the problem. So we'll go, that will be resolved maybe because some other idea was accepted. And what you end up with is a macro view with a sort of stoplight color coding of what you end up actually doing. So once you have your overview, you can either quickly do, go to kind of the, the executive summary version of you just follow the green line and you see what was actually decided and what was involved in that decision. Uh, and you can follow the red line and see, well, did they think of this? Yes, no. And why was that rejected? Sometimes when you look at the end result, you say, okay, but where did they start? So does this, can you keep the history of this so you can do time step and say, okay, I started? Or Short answer, in some pieces of software, that data is available. It's not <coughs> built into the features of the software for various reasons. It's actually, a project I'm involved in now, which is using uh, a lot of new uh, web frameworks for generating these online. Uh, and one of the key uh, focuses of the project, one of the key values in the project, is actually to have a sort of infinite undo feature. So using something like a, a CVS, like you'd use in um, programming, to track all of the changes and be able to play back, and even play back to a point and branch, and bring branches back together. And that's where you get a lot of exciting potential collaboratively of being able to take a set of ideas, look at their conclusions at a point, and say, well, just experiment. What if 
I added a set of ideas in a different way? What if I just evolved the relationships? You're talking about the, diff the difficulties of belonging and categorical thinking. Well, what if I combine these categories in a different way? Where did my, think where did my thinking end up and be able to compare those two different options? So that, that's a very uh, exciting potential thing uh, that some friends of mine are working on that um, we, I would like to play with that tool sort of thing. <laughs> what about using this as indexing into a, a recording of a verbal conversation? The critical, as you mentioned earlier today, I think the critical thing is getting this well, feedback. And we have a, I have a diagram later on that shows oh, that. Oh, okay. We're never going to get to that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, so I guess we'll quickly one more question from Jim and I'll move on to the next one. I was just oh. thinking of this as an indexing mechanism into a discussion that was going on on auditory mm -hmm. recordings. So you, don't, you have the richness of voice and, and discussion, but I want to really listen to mm -hmm. what was said, not just look at this diagram. Yeah, but that, that would just be a question of, like, each of these nodes has a timestamp on it. And so if you had a recording, then you could connect the timestamp. It's not a terribly complicated computational thing to do. Okay, so we get the idea of how there's this building of this network. Uh, the building of this network has the involvement of different people so that there's buy-in and so that uh, what's being put up reflects what people actually mean. Uh, and also the fact that the set of symbols implies different ways of expanding on the ideas so that we make sure that we fill out our, our, the space of our thinking and do things rigorously. So I'm going to go back to the presentation, hit the right combination of buttons. Right. So quick summary, kind of what I just said. Um, there's actually a whole textbook on this by a gentleman named uh, Jeff Conklin, who's based up in Sacramento. Um, it calls the method dialogue mapping, and it's just this of using the maps during a meeting. Um, hopefully, uh, these are sort of the suggested points. So, uh, we can discuss what later whether or not you agree with all of them. Uh, you see that it you've seen how it helps to clarify in terms of untangling the linear narrative of how we experience and perform discussion, helps provide rigor through the symbol system in terms of making sure that our claims have evidence and that we have the right problem definition. And also because of that structure, helps imply a way forward. If we're stuck, we can look for, well, maybe this, uh, this answer has more things for or against it, or maybe we don't have enough answers. In terms of sharing thinking, there's a collaborative result because everyone's contributed and uh, agreed in some fashion because they've had a chance to correct what's gone on. Um, there's continuous documentation, so we could have stopped the discussion at any point during the meeting, and the documentation would have com been complete up to that point. And that's a very interesting result in terms of um, my back background uh, engineering documentation. Engineers hate writing reports because the work is done, the value has been given, why do I want to do this thing that is only going to help some stakeholder potentially? Um, and it also depersonalizes, and this is particularly important in highly politically charged discussions when uh, you, know, you can turn around and say, well, I don't like so-and-so's idea and I like so-and-so's idea. This just becomes the idea, and by depersonalizing it, it helps untangle a lot of the uh, emotional interaction issues which can happen uh, in a tense meeting. Okay. So just a quick background. Uh, how did I come to this and what is my interest in that? Uh, the motivation for my research, in particular my PhD, was looking at uh, integrating the fragmented information uh, in engineering design. So uh, interesting statistics. Uh, companies uh, like major aerospace companies will generate on the order of terabytes of computer-aided drafting, computer-aided drawing data every single day. And they have a massive management problem of how do we even store that? And what do we do with it once we store it? Because stored information is only ever useful if it is then again retrieved at some point. How do people know what's there? Uh, this little equation down at the bottom is particularly important because it kind of reflects the thinking of engineering in terms of this integration problem. Well, if only we could connect together all the different equations and analyses that we do in order to create these final products, we would be able to make things more efficiently or more quickly. Unfortunately, there's an underlying very rationalist reductionist assumption there, which is that you're designing the same thing over and over again. Uh, and speaking with um, heads of systems engineering and whatnot uh, at uh, major engineering companies, there's an understanding at other levels that actually we don't design the same product every time. There are lots of little changes and those add up. And that's the only way we remain competitive. If we came up with this amazing integrated model, we would fossilize our processes and we would lose our competitiveness. Uh, the context that I've studied these diagrams in, so there's a, a sectional view of an aerospace engine, um, did a little bit of work uh, in Germany looking at a, a mechatronics project. We also managed to do a case study in fashion design, looking at a very different um, set of assumptions and skills, uh, and looking at applying the, we've also looked at applying the uh, different methods to civil engineering. Okay. Uh, and all of that together, the, 
for my research, the, the unifying thread is looking at the applicability and benefits and costs of using these software tools and visual methods. So when I talk about visual methods, in particular, I talk about using these diagramming grammars. So here's a more extended set of the things I was using in the, the earlier presentation. You can see it kind of forms sentence and paragraph-ish structures. So in the same way, the value of that is in the same way that a textbook with thousands and thousands of words in it is an approachable structure. Adding this little bit of additional structure on top of the basic elements of the network help makes, helps to make the entire uh, network a little bit easier to understand. Those representations or that language is supported on software which has, um, based on res my research, certain <coughs> elemental, certain key characteristics. One of those is that it has a diagramming focused user interface. So that means it's designed to get ideas down quickly. Um, as a counterpoint, for example, on one of the pieces of software, a simple statement with two nodes and a link takes something like three or four uh, clicks to generate. To do the same thing in something like PowerPoint takes 12 clicks to do. Now that doesn't sound like but a lot, but it adds up over time. And those 12 clicks are also 12 potential error points that you then have to correct with some sort of undo. So that massively affects the flow of getting the ideas down. And how does that compare to strokes on a whiteboard? Uh, it depends what you're trying to do. Strokes on a whiteboard in terms of time, I would imagine a whiteboard just getting the node down yeah. quickly would probably be faster and lower cognitive load on a whiteboard. How legible the individual's writing is will depend on the individual. Yeah, cl I mean, clearly handwriting is lousy. So mm -hmm. typing these depends on handwriting. Um, Unless you write in shorthand, which I don't think a lot of groups are necessarily. But like, there would be an option if people wanted to stick with paper. There, there are options to speed that sort of thing up. Yeah. Um, here's one of the points I brought up. I guess up, my yeah. point is that Sorry. PowerPoint may not be the best. I, I, I think you're exactly right about PowerPoint. Uh, uh, it's good at what it does, not the tool for this. True. Uh, I think something like Visio, which is a, di a visualization tool that people regularly use, might be a better, better I example. I don't think people regularly use it. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> for you and it's, too, it's too high overhead for most stuff. I mean, Visio is, we wrote it down on the whiteboard. Now I'm going to transcribe it into Visio. So it looks pretty in my presentation. The two diagrams a year that we really care about. It's mm -hmm. not an every, it's just too heavyweight to be an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. okay. what, I, what I like about it is that seems like a better thing to compare it to maybe a Google Bot because you can mm -hmm. have a lot of people in parallel across different distributed networks contributing at different times to the same conversation piece, mm -hmm. breaking down the problem into these little micro problems, right? Yeah. And that's actually a really good point in terms of contrast. So I talked about the difference between this or the, the analogy between this and sketching on a computer. A Google Doc is still kind of a representation of a piece of paper. You're not necessarily using the capabilities of the computer besides the obviously the, the communication component. Um, to improve your understanding or uh, the integration of the ideas that people are working on. It's still basically narrative text, basically on a format that's like what you would use on a computer. Um, the middle point is a point I covered before about incremental organization. You can start with a messy pile of ideas. If the underlying structure is a grid or a partial grid or a table, you do that. If it's a bunch of things belonging to different sets of categories, you do that. If it's actually just a network, then you represent it as a network. Uh, and the last point is about leveraging the different capabilities of the computer in terms of having different kinds of linking. And this is where um, the software differs more substantially from a lot of just drawing programs, is there are different options in the different programs for doing different kinds of linking. So we're talking about categorical um, relationships. Sometimes your evidence or your supporting information is an entire document. Sometimes it's a piece of text within that document. Maybe it's a calculation in a spreadsheet cell. Maybe it's a point in an image, but you still need to, under you still need to see the image in order to understand its context. Being able to represent all of those things all in one spot is very powerful. And the other element is how um, the diagrams that result from the work can actually be interconnected between each other. So what you end up with is a large set of networked views that look at the different ideas and their relationships from different perspectives. And those different perspectives can exist at the same time. Okay. So what do I mean when I talk about different examples and stuff like that? I picked two examples um, from research that myself and my colleagues have done. Uh, one from aerospace engineering and for contrast, a uh, case study we did in fashion design. So I uh, don't think it's a big stretch to suggest that things like turbofan jet engines in aerospace engineering are complex products. There's a lot going on there. There are tens of thousands of components, all of them, all of them being pushed to their material limits. Uh, one stat I like to pull out is uh, basically the air gets compressed here, burned here, and the energy gets removed from the air in the part called the turbine at the back. 
the, one of the limiting factors in the efficiency of the engine is the temperature at that exit point, the temperature of the air where the energy is being extracted. The turbine blades in that section are made out of very exotic materials that are capable of withstanding very high temperatures. And yet, they have very intricate cooling systems built in so that those blades can exist inside of an airstream which is 50 degrees hotter than the melting point of that exotic metal while spinning at 10,000 revolutions per minute for thousands and thousands of hours with minimal service. So that's how tight the problems are in aeros aerospace engineering. So let's look at uh, an example problem in aerospace engineering, looking at a, a turbine blade. So this is a, a piece of a um, publication uh, written by my uh, thesis advisor in 2009, looking at a failure they were having in the turbofan case. So the front of the engine is this great big fan that moves most of the air and provides most of the thrust. Uh, the front of it spins at about 3,000 RPM, which means it, if you imagine a fan blade that's like two and a half meters, eight feet wide, spinning at 3,000 RPM, the tips of those blades are moving faster than the speed of sound at high thrust, so uh, at takeoff, for example. And those tips are moving near the case with a clearance on the order of a couple millimeters. That's really loud. And one of the ways of absorbing all of that noise is actually to build a structure into the edge of that case which helps dissipate the noise. So the problem they were having is they have this structure which is a set of holes sitting on top of a honeycomb structure. What that does is it creates all sorts of disorganized different shaped air pockets which are really good at absorbing the noise of the shock waves coming off the blade tips. Um, the outer layer, the perforated bit, uh, was coming off in flight. Now it's important to note that this is actually was not a dangerous condition because that piece that came off, any bit that did come off, went past the engine and didn't actually damage anything. But it was still a problem they wanted to deal with. So they needed to diagnose why were the honeycomb layers splitting. So I'm going to show something a little bit complex. Brace yourselves a little bit. Here's the problem diagnosis for that design problem. Now it looks like a lot at first, but remember um, the exercise we did earlier, you've actually seen a lot of this and now that you've been through that exercise, you know a little bit of how to take it apart. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick one thread of discussion in there and we'll look at it in a little bit more detail. So underlying question, what causes the debonding? Debonding is fancy, fancy engineering talk for things getting unstuck. Uh, there were all sorts of different options proposed. Some of the options were rejected. So you can see this is a slightly different set of symbols. This was an in-house software uh, research tool. But they're still all basically the same elements. You have pro and con arguments with the pluses and ideas based on the light bulb and issues based on the question mark. There are also different options proposed. Uh, and here we're going to look at this adhesive failure one. So why did the glue come off potentially at elevated temperature? Well, if the glue is failing due to temperature, that means two things happen. One, the glue is sensitive to temperature. And two, that temperature was happening. So what are the evidences, for example, for the temperature happening? Well, initially, they were looking at early tests that said actually things weren't getting hotter. But they decided maybe we should look again. So here's a task note, and this is something that was discussed offline. They went and did an in-flight experiment and found actually the temperatures are higher than we expected. So in fact, the temperatures are occurring, and that element of the potential of the problem definition was accepted. So now we look at the image again. And hopefully, now that you've seen that you can sort of go through and it's systematic and you don't necessarily need to know a whole lot about engineering to understand that it's just a, what are the different reasons this sort of thing can happen and let's check whether or not those sorts of things are happening. Um, hopefully based on that and based on the signposting, this is a little bit less overwhelming. Um, also in this diagram, which we didn't do in the exercise, there's uh, supporting information included. And things like spreadsheets are often linked to the actual file. So if you need to follow up a piece of information, you just click on it and grab it. And there's a lot of cognitive value there of not having the distraction of going to talk to the, um, whoever's running the product data management system and saying, how do I find that file? Because I have no idea where it is in the file tree that nobody uses properly. And is this something that would be created during a meeting, or this is something that would be created in advance of a meeting to help structure a good discussion? I think um, it, it's not reported in the paper, but I would imagine the meeting would begin with that and maybe a couple of these different potential answers and early research. Uh, and then during a meeting, they would expand on that. And then the meeting, they might run out of time, or they might reach an impasse where actually we need additional information. And then they would split off and bring the new information in uh, at the end of the meeting. And that's another value of this is that it's a living document that remains consistent between meetings. So you can have one document which covers, and one single overview, which covers all of the thinking that you did on a series of meetings, not just one. Yeah? How can it be a living document that also remains consistent across different meetings if people are changing it? It's consistent it's not, it's because, 
it, it's, they're not perfectly, they're not identical, but if an item was brought up, that item is going to remain there. So there are elements here which maybe were brought up and not the investigation wasn't continued. That element is still there. So you're right in you terms of. That's it. Uh, sorry. So, so, yeah. So it's coherent, but it's it's no, it's not an identical thing. You're right. Uh, right. So we're all more or less okay with that. Do we have any questions at this point? So that's. Concludes basically the aerospace example. Uh, what's interesting about that case is that particular tool called the decision rationale editor actually was accepted enough by our partner Rolls Royce that it became a standard part of the engineering toolkit on all of the engineering workstations across the company. So if those documents come up in a meeting or whatnot, basically everyone can open it. Uh, so that's interesting because the research has had an effect on design practice. Um, academically, managed to produce all kinds of studies, uh, dozens and dozens. I think the uh, last Google search I looked at was something like 40, uh, about half a dozen. Uh, I managed to contribute to. Um, and the other thing is they're convinced enough by this proof of concept that there's ongoing method work using different kinds of symbol sets and whatnot for functional analysis, requirements management. I talked about that problem of ramming all those ideas into the database. And personal information management. So you're talking about uh, the problem with Visio not being an everyday tool. Well, this is a simple enough tool that some engineers are actively using it to just kind of track what they're doing every day and how that evolves and what documents they discuss so that if they need to go back, they can just search through their network. What did I do on that day? What documents did I pull up? Okay, uh, looking at fashion design. So uh, the context of this was a master's uh, class uh, doing a term project at the London College of Fashion. Uh, they picked as a project a shoe design competition run by Marks and Spencers. I don't know if you guys know uh, British brands, um, but they're fairly, they're major departments where it does all kinds of stuff, including um, uh, pre-made food and the clothing. Uh, and what we did is we trained them at the beginning of the project in different ways they could potentially use the diagram and then just followed what they ended up doing with them throughout the project. So unbeknownst to me, coming from an aerospace engineering background, uh, fashion is actually a very constrained creative discipline. They have very strict technical briefs. They have to do a whole lot of different market research to understand what's going on. They have to deliver these products to deadlines which, ver which are fixed seasonally. You have to get the new season's product in. Uh, and all that they have to do while creating a product that identifies or that speaks to someone personally. So they did all of that normal background work and then we found one of their first major uses was actually this um, process of converging or collating all of their di different divergent materials. So in that process of doing their background research, they would collect a lot of different bits and pieces. And ordinarily, all those bits and pieces would sit in folders on their computer. And a lot of them would actually, they told us, just end up getting neglected. So they'd be doing work, and that work would not be contributing to their final output. What the diagramming tool allowed them to do is at least put these things in semi-organized piles, depending on what they were doing. And when they returned to those piles, they were still in the same order. So unlike, for example, a folder uh, on a computer system or your desktop on the computer system, they had multiple views, as many as they needed, and views they could go back to and reinsert themselves uh, into in context and, and pick up where they left off in terms of the, the work. Or if they needed to refer back to something, it's like, oh, that was the, in that view, they can go back to roughly the same spot and use their spatial thinking to um, retrieve information. Um, this picture is a little bit fuzzy and it's also from, again, a different piece of software because we use different tools throughout. But uh, again, you can kind of see the same basic language of you have this issue, the issues or core questions. The potential answers here are actually being uh, presented as visual material. So these are sketches that the designer found and then argumentation for or against the sketches. And what that did is it helped them converge. So once they produced these piles of different ideas, the rationale notation helped them narrow down um, the potential products or directions or problem definitions based on existing products that they wanted to work with. Uh, they also did things like uh, annotate mood boards. So you can put the, the image in the background and actually say something, even though something like a mood board has a lot of tacit and implicit meaning woven within it, it often is still useful to be able to say something about the kinds of meaning that are pre represented in that. So here's another interesting diagram. Can anyone point out something that's interesting about the argumentation here? instead of using explicit words for things, part of their argumentation is actually images. So there's something about the association between that color and the different items being represented in the image, which is positive or negative. So here we're able to carry a little bit more explicit, uh, implicit meaning than you would with strictly converting to some sort of textual argument while still being able to make use of the structure. And that was interesting because I don't think I've ever seen that kind of argumentation in any of the engineering 
uh, case studies. So this is the fashion designers using more uh, visual thinking to do their structuring. Okay. Uh, results of this, first of all, it was, it was interesting because it's a proof of concept. Here's a tool which is designed around the uh, structuring of ideas in a very rigorous fashion, uh, and the students still liked it. Um, and we know that they actually liked it because we were able to find examples of use. We were able to triangulate the result there. Uh, it informed, the, how they used it informed the support needs for the fashion students. In particular, most of the maps, the vast majority, were actually these collating maps that they were using to organize the information for discovery. And then the next most common type of map was actually this um, rationale-based map where they were trying to narrow um, their different design options. Uh, in terms of performance, we also got some interesting results. Two out of the six or seven teams in the class ranked in the top two positions in the national competition. Uh, oddly, they were reversed, so the best in the class ended up being second nationally, uh, but they still placed quite well. Uh, and while it's difficult to tell because on average, uh, significant maps made by the teams only numbered about eight or nine, the team that did the best in the course, by far they got a distinction, uh, did by far, by far the largest number of maps. So while there might not be a correlation between using the map tools and getting better results, there's certainly a correlation between demonstrating how much thought and effort had been put into it uh, and the performance you get out of it. And that's going to be true for any software tool true. that you give to the team. I mean, what you really want to know is uh, if some students get this and others don't, does that affect their performance? Right. Or do the best equal amounts of material? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, do, the, do the best teams gravitate to this more than they would something else? And I think a comparison is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, our data was a little bit too coarse to do that, the number of maps and the, the presentation. But yeah, that's, that's exactly the kinds of refinement studies which we'll talk about later that this sort of thing points to. So while mentioning all those successes and keeping conscious of time, um, some quick points on limitations. So one of the metaphors I'll talk about this uh, providing the value that sketching does but on a computer-based system. Um, the result is that these diagrams do end up being more the glue than the cement. You don't do an entire project in this. You use this to help integrate the thinking across the project. Uh, visual literacy uh, is a term I use to talk about this issue of you present people with this big diagram of something, most importantly, if it's something they're not expecting, you can get disengagement uh, and finding ways to make sure that you have conventions of writing these things that other people will understand. So if you have a, a diagram in a meeting, everyone will understand it. But how do you author that? But what's the, what are the composition rules for these sorts of diagrams so that other people will understand it? Uh, and also software maturity. So most of the tools that we use are research-based tools. So we had development funding for a certain amount of time. Uh, and the core features are there, but there are other weird bugs and whatnot that just haven't been squashed. And they, that affects our ability to try things in new, new contexts. Okay. Uh, so going back to that original question, how does this potentially help improve thinking about thinking, thinking about creativity and, and thinking during collaboration? About these points of having uh, an incremental and expressive representation linked to content that you can then go to, connecting to the right problem, exploring the space carefully in order to be able to decide what is the space or cost of expanding the creative space that I'm coming with ideas in. And it's useful, demonstrated, to a broad range of designers. And so that suggests it could help form a sort of neutral language where uh, different kinds of integration could happen. Okay. Uh, and then I've got a couple of quick scenarios on how it might ab apply to the design lab, but I also am conscious of the time and can open to discussion now. Uh, do we have a preference of pressing forward, or does anyone have any pressing comments they want to talk about now? I do have one question, but I can hold Okay. So three quick, three quick scenarios. One about thinking. Um, how do you distribute thinking? How do you interact with ideas across the distance? So here's an example of, uh, this is the message board for part of the uh, Udacity Design 101 course. This is about the box problem. So how do you design a box that encourages people to interact with it in a certain way without putting textual or, or audio uh, instructions? And what's interesting here is if you didn't know where to start, you're presented with some open-ended questions, some completed examples, which maybe might fix it you on a potential solution, uh, and then partial description based on various things. And all of that is kind of lumped together. A potential alternative, if you did this based on diagramming, would be to allow the students to build their structure. And where they get stuck, they indicate where they need additional help. And then tutors online or in person can insert feedback right within that context, providing more of a nudge specifically in towards the element or, or the integration that the student needs without necessarily giving away the whole thing, while allowing them to, to, to be innovative or to have to work through and, and suffer through the thinking on their own for everything else. Uh, in terms of observation, so 
Not all designers will necessarily gravitate to this, but those that you can get to elicit or articulate some of their thinking in this ma manner um, will provide you all kinds of interesting insights into expert thinking patterns and how they problem solve and do they do depth first or breadth first or what combination of those and in what kinds of situations. One of the neat things about having this on a digital tool, there was a study done at the University of Southampton where they were designing a uh, UAV and they had all of the engineers on the project use one of the diagramming tools. And there you can see a plot of the different kinds of nodes created at different times throughout the project. And from a research perspective, this is really, really cool because it provides an exceedingly fine granularity view of what the process is, what process is going on. And you can see things about the process based on the slope of the lines for different things. So this sharp slope here is preliminary design. This leveling off is detailed design when they're doing most of their work in CAD and therefore not using the diagrams. And all of these little spikes are system integration issues. What's even more interesting about that is all of those little spikes and, and groups of clusters of activity are associated with particular diagrammatic elements. So we've now got quantitative overview to look for different patterns in what the designers are doing and fine granularity qualitative data as to what caused those patterns. So we can now make very uh, detailed causal arguments about what's going on and what are, cause, what are causing issues in this uh, instrumented so design process. Like, right? Sorry, uh, this is time, duration of the project. This is the number of elements, so the number of questions or answers or resource nodes. Uh, and so here's the total number of nodes written into the network of maps. So this isn't a single map with 1,600 nodes. This is probably dozens and dozens of maps with 1,600 nodes total. Um, and see, what do we got? Uh, this particular diagram is actually showing what the different teams are doing. So this is instrumenting the design process of the different teams and when are they troubleshooting versus doing preliminary design. Uh, I would say if you were trying to talk about the proportion of time or the kinds of information people are seeking out at different points in, in the, uh, the work, or if you look at, see how these spikes are happening at the same time? So that's probably a system integration problem between the simulation uh, and mission definition teams. And then you can go that's in and actually, right? yeah, that's, that's still correlational. So we found something interesting. And now in terms of the causal argument, let's go and find those nodes and see what they were talking about. And then we can make statements about what kinds... Still correlational. True, that there was a... Always. <laughs> that these two events have this happened at the same time. So... Um, causal hypotheses. Yeah, yeah would probably would be a better way of phrasing it. Yeah, sorry, I'm using the wrong terminology. Or, or at least or trace down that hypothesis and then go and talk to the designer and say, why was this a problem? And if you talked about it sooner and actually have evidence as to whether or not they talked about things sooner. Okay. Uh, and then finally, in terms of making, both making the tools and making tools for designers, on the conventional end of things, we've got things about software refinement, uh, coming up with better ways of, uh, of authoring these documents, uh, looking at different features of the authoring conventions which affect performance, uh, different ways of integrating. So. This is a computer-based tool. It's never going to replace paper, but how do you improve the workflow of getting sketches into it? Uh, and then new, new, def new methods development, so things like how do we make this work on an online discussion like a Google Doc, especially in the context of a uh, design course. Uh, research workflows, so in terms of developing research products, stuff like that. On the more unconventional end, so here I've got a screenshot from Minority Report. There's an underlying question here of, does this do something interesting in terms of a representation which could be useful for a lot of the emerging technologies. Now, how do you take advantage of a 4K display? You know, it, is it really useful to write an email on a 4K display compared to writing it on a smaller display? Not much. But if you're trying to compose that email, email using lots of supporting information that you're trying to integrate into it, then you're starting to be able to use that space. And to have a notation that you can lay on top of that desktop to help you think about how you're combining things could be very powerful. Um, I guess before closing uh, too much, so I absolutely must acknowledge all of my collaborators and supporters. Um, Rob Bracewell, who was, uh, and John, who are my uh, thesis supervision team. Rob doing the development work on the Rolls-Royce tool. 
Marco, my supervisor at Imperial College, who organized a lot of the work, including the uh, fashion design case study, and Helen, who did the work on the software, which I did the demo in, uh, as well as leading the actual fashion design case study, and our many, many um, financial supporters. All right, so thanks, everyone. And now, open the discussion. Questions? Okay, so the, the two questions. This is a, a quick one from talking about PowerPoint. So is it something everyone accepts? No. Uh, and what is it about their personality or the context of when they're introduced to the diagrams that causes them to accept it more or less? We don't know. Uh, I guess I'd really like to know, like, have you done experiments where you've shown people these kinds of diagrams and tested their understanding? And no, the bulk, um, the bulk of the studies have been introduce and do some sort of observational work to just get a scope of where are the major issues. There's one study that was done by uh, the top two names that were on the list, uh, Marco and Rob, looking at differences in comprehension between narrative documents and, and these diagrams. So the story behind that is at Rolls-Royce, they had these things called design definition reports. Whenever a design change was done, they would fill in this form that would kind of describe what they did and why they did it. Uh, one of the things that the rationale editor tool has done is it helps to augment those reports with a more thorough documentation of what went on without forcing the engineer to write that much more narrative because they don't like doing that anyway. Uh, and so the, the study looked at, basically took the same material, uh, took the de definition reports and the diagrams and introduced them to, uh, I think it was like 12 engineers for each type. Uh, and they found some shifts in how the understanding was maybe better uh, in the diagrams, but not significant, and it was a smallish group. What was nice about that study was they did take engineers from the company that had been trained in the tool, so they didn't have that initial rejection bias. I can dig out that paper if you want to see more detail. Yeah. Sorry, and I uh, didn't answer your second question. I don't think. Okay. So I was just wondering, uh, when you were sort of first introducing the tool, mm -hmm. Uh, in fashion design, it probably would have been one student working on it most of the time. So yeah. 
Yeah, th there would have been a lead. So yeah. I was wondering, did you see any, um, any sort of tension around that power dynamic? Because they really have a lot of power to like, mm -hmm. shape the meeting and, and to push their own agenda. Because I know if I was a Machiavellian engineer and I got to be the minute taker, I would definitely push things in the direction of things that I thought were right and that I wanted to pursue. So did you see any of those tensions? Or any of those I've, I've heard of some of that tension. So fundamentally, this is, I go back to my metaphor, of it's a fancy pencil. Um, and as a piece of technology, it is value neutral. So there are examples where if the person running it is trying to listen, then you will get a more collaborative outcome. And I've also heard secondhand of examples where um, people have just used it as a way of pushing forward and rationalizing their pet project. So it, yeah, it, it, can, it can go either way, and that's an element that's a social dynamic as much as anything. Uh, I think the key to it is an underlying question, and I, I, would, I would hope the answer would be one way or another, but I don't know, is whether or not having this helps budge things in the right direction. Uh, for the dialogue mapping method uh, promoted by Conklin, uh, the method mapper is actually not necessarily a stakeholder. They are just a meeting facilitator who's trying to actively listen to what people are doing and combine their inputs. So the idea there is that that diffuses things a bit because the, the facilitator doesn't have a political stake in what's going on. What makes you think it's value neutral? I mean, you listed a whole set of values that uh, this encouraged. Oh, um, I was talking more in terms of the, so, I believe that those are the values that it contributes, but I was talking about in terms of a technology or a representation in general, how you use it can be directed one way or another. That's why I meant, so maybe ambivalent is a better term as opposed to value neutral, strictly. Because I mean, it has a very strong set of values about, so it privileges things like inference or this connects to that, mm -hmm. whereas whiteboards uh, have a different set of values that are more freeform. And so I think any representation is strongly value laden. Okay. When these are being drawn in real time, are they visible to the participants? Yes, that's, that's the point of this, is, at least the, the mapping method, is that it's, it's a shared so that in real time. Yes. Say, no, that's <laughs> Which is another value. I mean, the, the fact that it's collaboratively shared is a, is a strong value. Yeah. Oh, but you don't understand how manipulative moving this work. If I'm taking the minutes, I don't have to manipulate the moving. Because I just write the minutes anyway. Are there examples of like medieval sketch artists documenting technology and they'd only draw the part that they could see and so their representations of technology from back then are actually very skewed because they weren't the makers? It seems like also the, the way to link these different things. I mean, some of us have worked on you know, trying to link up paper and digital. And instead of having one be the replacement of the other, how do you, how do you make them you know, use both and mm -hmm. be able to link back? And so how to make the room that you're putting together yes. physically and stuff link into that. And so not getting in the battle of this versus that, but how to exploit the best of each. Yeah. Or where in, in, the flow of, in the flow of the creative process, is, is there 
characterize these as kind of information rich, but I think in comparison to physical media, they're, they're really in, they're sort of very low information density. Mm -hmm. yeah, but actual clarity is different. So maybe this is a more explanatory tool, and maybe a physical media is a more generative tool. I think this is really good for the intermediate stage of uh, problem generation and understanding. It, allows, it makes you, it forces you to be explicit about the issues and how they relate. I think this would be a horrible tool in the initial brainstorming because there you actually want to get a free flow of ideas. You don't mm -hmm. want to be disturbed by this kind of. Yeah. And that's a good point because the, the Rolls Royce tool, one of the case one of the use cases is actually for brainstorming, not the brainstorming itself. They do that on whiteboards and sketches, and they all go into their corners and come back together or whatever. But then they import those sketches into the diagramming tool and use that annotation system to then rationally sort out and recombine. That's like a really good use of two very different techniques to mm -hmm. take the trends of each. The whiteboard, because it's free, you can get ideas out really quickly, you can sketch them out, you can leave space. But the second one is, OK, now we're going to switch modes and do deep introspection. And green hat to black hat, or whatever it is. No, no, no. Oh. It's white hat and green hat. They're neutral. They're not biased. Hmm. <laughs> black and white implies good and bad. I was mean the Debono, the Debono thinking hats. I forgot which color associated with which. See if I can quickly find. I don't know if I have a slide up that shows. Yeah, um, I can show you later that there's a, a figure in a couple of the different publications that's used. But basically, you would do that, and you take a photo of it with your camera or with your phone or whatever, import it into the tool. Uh, the tool has image import functions. So you just drag and drop into the map, and that would be an image surrounded by white space. Uh, and then you do your rationale. And then if you want to, you then take those different critiques and look at how, um, if we're in engineering, for example, look at the function definitions, what does the system need to do? And you actually integrate that with um, a morphological chart or a um, decision matrix uh, in order to uh, just, just integrate the workflow of, you know, we, we gave, in the decision matrix, we gave this a score of six because in this image, there were this many cons and that image came from that. The problem with that, though, is it, it's not a bi-directional workflow, but is right? Is it like a unique, um, one person kind of score the sketching and that, that other? The, the sketching is done however the sketching would be done. So I've, I've seen four engineers working on different corners of a whiteboard and then talking to each other. I've seen different sketches from paper pads put together, or it could be a collaborative meeting where one person is kind of doing the note-taking sketching and everyone throwing ideas at them. Okay, well, let's thank Nathan for the presentation. Thank you for listening.